Hi, everybody. Um, nice to see you all here. My name is Stephen Fraley. I'm the editor of uh, Dear Dave magazine, and it's also my great pleasure to be the chair of the uh, photo program here at SVA. Um, let me make a few uh, introductions first. Um, uh, Laura Larson is every. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> that was good. Laura Larson is represented by Leonard, Lennon Weinberg Gallery in New York, and she has published projects in Cabinet, Open City, The Literary Review, and Documents. Her work is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York, the Deutsche Bank, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And her work has also been reviewed in Art Forum, The New York Times, and The New Yorker. Lau Rexer is, is the author of several books about photography, including Photography's Antiquarian Avant-Garde and The Edge of Vision, The Rise of Abstraction in Photography, which was published by Aperture Magazine in 2009. In addition to book projects, he has published many catalog essays and contributes to the New York Times, Art in America, Modern Painters, Aperture, Dear Dave, Metropolis, and Parquet, and he's a regular columnist for Photograph Magazine. Lyle was educated at Columbia University and attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He teaches at the School of Visual Arts. Mark Alice Durant. <laughs> Mark's essays have appeared in numerous journals such as Art in America, Aperture, Dear Dave, and After Image, and in catalogs and monographs regarding the work of Vic Muniz, Jimmy Durham, Marco Breuer, Richard Lerod, Robert Heineken and McDermott and McGuff. He, is a, he has a distinguished teaching career and is a professor in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Maryland and visiting faculty at the ICP. In 2001, uh, 2011, rather, he founded the website stlucy.com. So we're gathered here uh, this evening on a very cold New York uh, night anticipating the snow tomorrow. Uh, to celebrate the publication of Mark's 27 Contexts, an anecdotal history of photography and Laura's hidden mother, uh, and the thrilling launch of St. Lucie Books. There will, be, there will be a signing in the lobby directly afterwards, and I hope you all will stay. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I do want to thank SVA Photo, um, Jared Dave, Maria Dubon, um, especially Stephen Fraley, um, who's you know been a supporter and friend for a long time. Um, just you know, Dear Dave is a fantastic publication. I mean, it's I love its broad embrace of photography in all its forms, and I have to say that I think without um, the, some of the opportunities I've had in uh, writing things for uh, Dear Dave, I'm not sure 27 Contacts would have happened. Um, I wrote an essay called Trickle Down Counterculture for Dear Dave a number of years ago, and, um, and I proposed it to Steve, and he said, sure. And it was very eccentric, you know, um, essay about um, being a teenager and discovering photography, and um, I think that was the beginning, because um, when I wrote that, um, another friend of mine read it and said, you've been waiting all your life, you've been working on that piece all your life, or something like that, and I suddenly thought that maybe there's a book there. So um, thank you again for the opportunities. Um, so I'm going to read um, a couple of, just a, so 27 Contexts is um, kind of an odd um, kind of uh, book in that it's sort of Wee's memoir, photographic history, um, some theory of my own images and other people's images. So it was difficult to place with other publishers, shall we say, and which sort of was one of the reasons why St. Lucie Books is, exists now. But um, I just wanted to say it sort of traces my sort of interest and my involvement in photography um, in, uh, in these various chapters, like this chapter is about my father's photographs from um, Korea, which I was obsessed with as a child. Um, this is a story about my experiences in Central America and uh, in the great uh, friendship and um, hospitality that I um, received from Paola Ferraria, who is in the audience today. And so she's in this, uh, in this story. 
Um, and I live in Baltimore, um, which is a great place and conflicted place, but really amazing place. And uh, I'm interested in like the the idea of Baltimore and the public popular imagination. So, John Waters versus The Wire. So I'm going to read for you um, a, an excerpt from this essay, "Falling in Love with Kadelka," and then uh, read uh, this a full essay uh, called uh, "An Image for Larry Sultan." And I chose these two because uh, one is uh, they're both about being young <laughs> and about studying photography, and I thought it was an appropriate uh, sort of topic for SBA. So again, I'm just going to read a sort of excerpt from this essay. Well, let me start with this image here. Sorry. Several nights a week, I worked in a bar in Harvard Square around the corner from Cafe Algiers, a Middle Eastern restaurant run by a hostile, diminutive Palestinian who gave me the evil eye every time I stopped in for hummus and mint tea. I endured his silent intimidation because every woman who worked there was charming and beautiful. I had a crush on them all, and one in particular, Allison, who always rushed past my table without a glance. After several weeks of smiling in her general direction in a way that I hoped was not too creepy, she and I finally exchanged a few words. Lucky for me, she was interested in photography, and I asked her if she wanted to go see the Joseph Kadelka exhibition that had just opened at the Carpenter Center for the Arts at Harvard. Later that week, after coffee at Cafe Pamplona, we walked up the street and ascended the concrete ramp to Le Corbusier's building, the only design he realized in North America. My first hint at Allison's instinctual creativity was that while I wore the expected punk rock pins on my lapel, she adorned her torn gray t-shirt with a twig of thorns and a black and white snapshot of a girl running through the grass. Born in 1938, Joseph Kadelka is a Czech photographer whose black and white photographs swirl with visceral graininess. Trained as an aeronautical engineer, he worked with theater companies as a photographer, and his early images appear like discarded visions of Samuel Beckett, evocative and malformed. His first long-range project was documenting, documenting Romani life in Romania and Czechoslovakia. In August 1968, he was witness to the Soviet invasion of Prague and applied his alienated vision to the brute force of history. One of his most famous, well-known, one of his most well-known images was taken in a moment before the Russian tanks could be seen, although the threatening rumble could be felt. An arm thrust into the frame from the left, its wrist watch, wrist watch tells us it's 1222, as if to proclaim, this is the exact moment that it happened. In the background, a prominent pra Prague Boulevard fades to a soft blur, an evacuated stage anxiously awaiting the arrival of the oppressor. As a result of these photographs, he was forced to leave his homeland, and although he immigrated to France, he adopted a nomadic life in which the camera was his passport and photography was his home. Kadelka has remarked that photography is a kind of theater for which the play has not been written. His embrace of statelessness has served him to create decades of photographs that act as temporary shelters, rest stops along the road to self-imposed yet permanent exile. Allison and I shuffled from frame to frame, transported by Kadelka's hard-edged lyricism. We were not ready yet to hold hands, but I felt tethered. Acutely aware of our shifting attentions, we were alternately drawn into Kadelka's worlds and then gravitationally pulled back and toward each other. We stood for many minutes in front of an image taken in Spain, 1971, of what appeared to be some kind of feast day or carnival. Several men in dark suits are standing in the play of highlights and long shadows of late afternoon. One man has just released a firework toward the sky, his left hand gesturing in, in the canonical ray of light catching in the smoky trail. It is a holy image, secular and sacred. Its effects seem to extend into the gallery, suffusing us with an, with an aura of possibilities, a bubble of elevated tenderness. Our relationship was born in photography, and our connection evolved as a kind of extended photo shoot. Suspended between childhood and adulthood, not yet caught in the sticky concerns of career and family, we were actors in our own play, testing identities as if trying on itchy sweaters in a secondhand store. We staged miniature dramas for the sake of being photographed. Photo excursions took us to Provincetown in winter and abandoned factories at night. We traveled to the Yucatan and to Berlin. We photographed ourselves crunching along frozen sand dunes and dreaming lazily in bed. We drove into the field of daylilies during a nocturnal excursion in the Boston suburbs and photographed our silver car as if it had just dropped down from Mars. 
meandering around Stonehenge in pale winter light, trying to figure out how to make a picture. We settled on closed eyes and thumb sucking in front of the brooding megaliths. We filled rooms with candles, drank wine, and lit old photographs on fire. With gleeful abandon of photographic rules, we left the camera's shutter open too long. We swung the camera in an arc. Like drunken bartenders, we mixed light sources on a quest to pour mind-altering concoctions, combining the warmth of tungsten with the sickly green of fluorescence, the cool constancy of daylight with flickering yellow flame. Sometimes they produce surprising results. <clears throat> I photographed a group of men digging out a tree root in the front yard at night. The orange glow of the headlights mixed with my camera's flash to reveal a portal to the underworld, as if Lucifer himself had made the image. The picture was fiery and clotted with fragmented bodies. The camera inspires a performative attitude. To be imaged is to, be, is to participate in an infinite process of replication, to be made inauthentic, an artifact of surfaces. Like Adam and Eve renego renegotiating self-consciousness, we embraced the expulsion and cultivated theatricality instead. We were unashamed. Thinking of ourselves innocent outcasts, we invented a photographic universe of our own romantic statelessness. Photography was our anchor, our communion, our validating ritual, connecting us to each other, to the present ecstatic moment, and to a history of image makers we considered our aesthetic ancestors. Every release of the shutter was an unspoken bow to Kadelka, to Robert Frank, to Andre Cortez, to Julia Margaret Cameron, and a host of other photographic celestials. Okay, that's, so that's from Falling in Love with Kadelka. It's longer, but that's all I'm reading from that. So this essay is um, for Larry Sultan, who is my teacher at the San Francisco Art Institute. And each chapter starts with a little quote. This one's from Larry. Like a ventriloquist who laughs at his dummy's jokes, I keep trying to make photographs that seduce me into believing in the image, although time knowing better, but believing anyway. My faith in photography as a path forward deepened. Not, no longer was it only about making pictures. I wanted to study photography as a phenomenon. The dichotomy between photographs as an art form and as a documentary tool generated a, comp a compelling conflict, and I wanted to move toward the heat of it. I also felt that I had to make a choice between music and photography, Boston and elsewhere. I fantasized about going to, the graduates, to graduate school at the San Francisco Art Institute and work double shifts at the bar to save money. After work, I spent most, most nights in the dark room building a cohesive portfolio. My clothes stank of chemicals at the end of each print, printing session. Dozens of wet photographs hung on clotheslines across my apartment as the sun was coming up. I applied not once, not twice, but three times before I was admitted. In early 1983, I received the good news that I was finally accepted to the MFA program starting in the fall. In August, my mom hosted a going away barbecue in her backyard. I invited everyone I ever knew. <laughs> Old girlfriends and former high school revolutionaries shared Budweiser and Sangria with my brothers and cousins. Young people with bleached hair and unexpected body piercings came up my mom's driveway, prancing through a gauntlet of aghast aunts and uncles. My mom loved the eclectic gathering, and so did Sister Frances, my great aunt, who was a Catholic nun. Sister Frances was old school and still wore a, f a fairly elaborate black and white habit. But she was the most joyful, loving, and tolerant of all my relatives. Being a retired educator, she loved books as much as I did, and I would be forever grateful for the astronomy and space travel books that she gave me throughout my childhood. I regret that I never made a photograph of her. Toward the end of the day, my aunt Roberta cornered me as I came out of the bathroom. She married and left Boston at 17 to run a mink farm in southern New Hampshire. During summer breaks from school, I was often shipped off to work there. My job was to fill the water trays, which required pulling enormous lengths of hose down the paths between the rows of hundreds of cages. The swarms of black flies and mosquitoes combined with the stench of rotting food and mink shit made those afternoons hellish. Minks are skittish, and are skittish and animated animals, and what haunted me most was the clickety-clack of their claws as they madly scampered in circles in their, around their small wire cages. The incessant metallic noise canceled out the birds and the frogs and the crickets and otherly, other pleasingly country sounds. Roberta, who raised six children and then drove a school bus after the mink farm failed, 
was suspicious of all things upper class. That included higher education, which she considered impractical. What are you going to graduate school for? She asked, pronouncing graduate school with no small amount of disdain. I sheepishly mumbled something about studying photography. She looked at me unblinkingly and asked a question I was unable to answer then, and I'm still at a loss to come up with an acceptable answer. Don't you know how to work that goddamn camera yet? <laughs> Despite Roberta's piercing question, two weeks later, Allison and I were on the road to San Francisco, making lovely photographs of fields of sunflowers bobbing their heavy heads under the Nebraskan sky. Larry Salton was one of my teachers when I entered the graduate program at the Art Institute. It's difficult to separate my first impressions of him from the sensory shift I was experiencing living in a new environment. I had grown up in stingy Boston and all the sensual and hedonistic cliches of San Francisco were fre fresh revelations to me. Pacific light illuminating white stucco and pastel Victorian homes, fog slithering under the Golden Gate Bridge, the vertigo one felt uh, breaking at stop signs at the top of impossibly steep, steep streets, the rows of majestic palms running the length of Dolores Street, calla lilies blooming in the backyard, images of the Virgin of Guadalupe painted in hallways and dangling from rearview mirrors, mariachi bands and aging beatniks, the triacal scent of night blooming jasmine after a long evening in a smoky bar. The graduate photography seminar met down the hall from the courtyard fountain. In Studio 16, a high-ceilinged room with, a huge arched, with huge arched windows and balconies overlooking North Beach and the marina. Once a week for the next two years, the graduate students gathered here for critiques and discussion. Larry was often the seminar leader. First impressions are fleeting, fragmentary, and vivid. His boyish hair, brown leather coat, gray suede shoes, elbows on his knees while he rolled a cigarette and spoke of secret things. His critiques of student work were precise analyses punctuated by exuberant laughter. He laughed at himself, at pretension, at earnestness, at failure, at success. He quoted Aristotle, Virginia Woolf, and Walter Benjamin. When he recited this passage from Rilke, I want to be with those who know with I want to be with those who know secret things or be left alone. I only wanted to be with him. Professionally, Larry is between his brown, groundbreaking collaboration with Mike Mandel, Evidence, which was published in 1977 and was just beginning to work on what would be his opus, Pictures from Home, which would not be published until 1992. Having studied photography in the social humanist tradition as an undergraduate, I was woefully ignorant of the seismic shift occurring in photographic practice in terms of appropriation, authorship, pastiche, and irony. In other words, the whole postmodernist thing. Evidence is a modest portfolio of 59 photographs culled from various industrial, police, and governmental archives, such as NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab. It was the urtex of my epiphany that the process of photography didn't end with the mounting and matting of a beautifully printed image, but that photographic meaning continually shifted in its relationship to context, presentation, and language. Turning Evidence's pages, we encounter images such as what appears to be an astronaut doing push-ups on a carpeted floor. An image of a hand holding a wooden ruler up to a damaged white wall. A pencil-drawn arrow points to nothing. And an image of a group of hard-headed men wading into a flood of foam. The unanswerable questions pile up. What could these pictures possibly mean? Each one is a random enigma, as if taken by an indecisive alien anthropologist who couldn't commit to any specific inscrutable human activity. Originally, these photographs were meant not meant to be art. They were illustrative and evidential. But lifted from their original context, the images became strangely mute, defiantly uncommunicative, and radically autonomous. Fixed as they appear to be, photographs are unstable and contingent on context to fulfill their utility. The simple act of prying them from their context creates surrealist puzzles. They point, as all photographs do, but we cannot understand what they are pointing at. Larry joked, <clears throat> that now he had been labeled a postmodernist. He wasn't sure he could create emotional and sensual pictures for fear of being self-indulgent. Although he laughed about it, the dilemma was real. He demanded rigor from his work, but did not want to exclude beauty. He had been photographing swimmers underwater and was deeply ambivalent about the results. He, bought a, he brought a box of prints to class and spread them across several tables. I thought they were lovely, 
Pale arms reached toward the surfaces, headless torsos glided through various shades of blue, the water between bodies a kind of liquid confirmation of our connectedness. These underwater pictures made me yearn for freedom. I ached to float there among them, as if I could escape the stubborn weight of my own history. I'm not sure that Larry ever exhibited these photographs, but I believe that the lessons he learned from making them helped him achieve the acute elegance of pictures from home. For over a decade, he photographed his parents in their suburban Los Angeles home. He photographed his father practicing his golf swing in the living room and sitting on his bed in his business suit like an actor forever waiting for his cue. He photographed his mother partially obscured by a window screen, proffering a monstrous uncooked turkey with big dabs of butter stuck to the pale skin. In one of his more well-known photographs from this series, his mother, dressed casually but elegantly, stares back at the camera as she leans against an avocado green wall. You can almost feel her conflicting impulses to appear relaxed yet presentable. Her husband, meanwhile, appears oblivious to the loaded dynamic, directing his attention to the Dodgers game on TV. In these pictures, Larry seemed to be dismantling masculinity, domesticity, and mid-20th century American fantasies of success. His father complained that Larry was making him look old, and although sympathetic, Larry refused to flinch from the truth of description. He struggled to balance compassion and critical distance in his photographs. Pictures from home and later in his later work photographing porn sets in the San Fernando Valley redefined observational photography in the sense that he was able to create fantastical documents that shimmer between myth and reality. As a teacher, Larry connected the dots between history, culture, material process, and personal responsibility. He joined us for drinks after seminar one evening, and slightly drunken, I told him a story about my Aunt Roberta, cor Roberta cornering me at a going away party. He loved it. Don't you know how to work that goddamn camera yet? He would laughingly ask whenever I push pin my photographs to the wall in class. His mantra was that artists were involved in the creation of meaning, and that this required a lifelong commitment. He taught me that being an artist is to create your own path, both internally and externally. He would sometimes quietly say, this image really sings to me, when a photograph touched him in some way. Not only did Larry help me envision what it meant to be an artist, but I also learned so much about being a man. Growing up, uh, growing up most of the men in my life were drunks and tyrants. I didn't really understand at the time that part of my West Coast grad school sojourn was partly a search for a kind of maleness that I could live with. When I graduated from the Art Institute in 1985 in lieu of an artist statement, I wrote this minor allegory based on a recent dream for the ex exhibition catalog. When I learned of his illness and passing in, in 2009, I understood with fierce clarity that Larry is at the heart of this image. The ground is uneven, broken earth, shattered boulders. It is difficult to walk. The fog erases any possibility of identification. I am walking in one direction, and I think the earth is ancient. There is a tall man half stride behind me to the left. I don't know how long he has been with me. Even this close, he is only a vague form in the thick mist. From under his cloak, he pulls a trumpet. I cannot watch too closely because I am still stumbling along. He raises the horn to his lips and lets out one long, beautiful cry. The mist begins to clear, and I see children walking in front of me in pairs and threes and singly. They are moving along in quite a deliberate fashion. Some of them are holding hands. I feel comforted by their presence and their apparent knowledge of our destination. When the note of the trumpet fades, the fog again enshrouds. It is still difficult to walk, but I continue by thinking of the sound that clears the mist and of holding hands. Thank you. So I just want to bring up Laura and Spinett, who's been just an incredible gift to my life. So welcome, Laura Larson. I want to thank Stephen and Lyle for so generously hosting this event. And I especially want to thank Mark, um, who believed in Hidden Mother um, and who's also become a dear friend. And I'm so delighted to be part of St. Lucy Books um, and also just to see a lot of lovely friends in the audience. So um, just a quick introduction. Um, 
That's actually the first hidden mother I ever bought. Um, but this book came out of, I was um, asked to contribute an essay about uh, motherhood for a collection that my colleague Jenny Klein put together. And she asked me to do it to write from the perspective of um, motherhood through adoption. And she asked me while I was in the legal process, and it was actually, she asked me to write this essay even before um, my daughter got to say I received her referral. So um, I wrote, so the idea, the sort of speculative nature um, of becoming a mother was kind of part of this project from the very beginning. And so um, that essay is what became the book. Um, while I was in the process of writing the book, I realized there hadn't been um, an exhibition of this material. So while I was writing the book, I also organized um, an exhibition of this material that sort of traveled for a couple of years. So these were both, um, I'd never written a book and I'd never curated an exhibition. And they were both very much a way in which in the sort of early years of being a mother um, and a single mother, um, I was kind of able to work and be an artist and really quite literally snatching, you know, five or 10 minutes, you know, just to write. And, you know, all of those little pieces finally came together as a book. So the book um, is about this vernacular practice and, my first introduction to it was from a friend, Bernard Yana Lewis, who's in this room tonight. And I really had a moment when I first saw these images, which like of incredible clarity of what it meant to be a mother. And um, in many ways, writing this book was like kind of a way of beginning to understand that in some ways, which is something I, I couldn't have articulated at that at that particular moment. So Looking at these photographs for me became a way to sort of talk about this particular interval of our adoption, which was essentially from the time I got my first photograph of Godese um, to when I actually met her. So um, that's the introduction, and I will read now. In 19th century portrait studios, photographers employed a number of different strategies to stabilize the body during the long exposures of the camera. Sitters leaned on pedestals to steady themselves. Necks were held in a pincer-like brace. A pair or a group might ballast one another, leaning together an arm thrown over a shoulder as if being photographed was like taking a boat ride on choppy water. To sit for a portrait was to submit to physical discomfort. The photographer too must tense and harness their body to execute the tasks of production. Head cloaked with black fabric to block the light, he, it is almost always a he, leans over the bulky view camera and squints, pressing his eye to the loop and the loop to the glass to focus the image. Muscles strain and ache as if in empathy with the subject. To make a photograph is to see with the whole body. Photographing children presented the operator with a specific set of challenges. Pedestals and braces can't be used on the small unruly bodies of infants. The photographer enlists the mother to play an instrumental role. Her body props the infant, steadying and comforting while the film is exposed. Hold still. The hidden mother appears in many forms, playing a structural but visually peripheral role in these portraits. Often she is swathed in fabric, her concealed lap acting as a pedestal for her infant. Her form becomes indistinguishable from the appointment of the scene. She is armature and background. These images remind me of dressing up as a ghost when I was a kid, throwing a sheet over my head and running around, arms outstretched, moaning. Sometimes the mother inhabits the margins of the frame, the fact of her body several feet away, providing enough reassurance to allow the child to sit quietly. Her arm reaches into the frame, or her body can be seen crouching behind a chair or pram. She whispers to her child, Mama's here.
When the portrait staging is insufficient to the task, the photographer turns to other techniques to isolate the child on the finished plate. A mat placed over, a mat placed over the plate vignettes the image, centering the baby and occluding the mother. Sometimes the measures are more drastic. If she can't be concealed, her face is scratched away, revealing the black enameled surface of the tintype. Alternatively, a thin layer of black paint is used to mask her presence. The implicit violence of these practical strategies raises the question, why not photograph mother and child together? I'm taking liberties. I want to bulge and erupt to bleed into the frame. It's a lot of post-its. <laughs> and I'll interrupt for a second. Um, this is a quote from Camera Lucida by Roland Barb, which is a kind of important frame of reference for this book. And here the essential question first appeared, did I recognize her? My first photograph of Godesse is nothing more than a mugshot, its purpose to duly record her entry into institutional care. The harsh light of the flash marks her official identity as an orphan. Certain facts stated. She doesn't look into the camera. Under my gaze, the photograph shrugs off these moorings. I think I detect a little smile on her stunned face. It's the only picture I have, and I'm greedy for more. She is touched by light. She is luminous. Godesse's arms are painfully thin, and a white onesie hangs loosely from her body. Her eyes are huge and alert. The director of the adoption agency reports that she is very small for her age. It's impossible for me to tell from the photograph. The lessons I have taught my students about context and meaning loom up. I can see her, but she floats. I station the image on my computer's desktop and my cell phone. I make multiple prints of it as if willing her into physical presence. It's duplication and elaboration and invention. The tiny digital file yields a smear of pixels at four by six inches. She is even lighter than paper, her skin the surface of the print. I would wait seven months before bringing Godesse home, and this time would be measured in photographs, a stream of them that formed a virtual umbilical cord between us. They instructed me, she's growing, she's healthy, but my desire animated them, seizing and elaborating upon the details of her. They reassured me of her presence in the world and reminded me of our separation. Like a hidden mother, I was bound to and separated from my daughter. I try writing to her, a short note every day, every few days, to bring her closer. I write that I love her and I can hardly wait to bring her home. After several notes, my disposition toward her becomes confused. I address her as the child I will bring home, then as an adult, a young woman I've raised. She keeps appearing to me as a teenager. In this rehearsal of attachment, I'm already anticipating other future stages of separation. Her body moves away from mine. Will she return? And I quote Bart again. A sort of umbilical cord links the body of the photograph thing to my gaze. Light, though impalpable, is here a carnal medium, a skin I share with anyone who has been photographed. I love the implication that photography's appetite is indiscriminate, that it is an omnivorous medium, and the way Bart links the carnal to the mother's body. Desire doesn't choose, it lands. And although he writes these passages in mourning, I recognize my own longings in them, dispersed and reconfigured. Godesse's body tugs at mine through this phantom cord. I have no use for the metaphor of gestation with its orderly rationing of time. It can't account for the currents of my weight that pitch me back and forth. I have no memories yet, yet the photographs make me feel as if I do, and they wobble under the weight of my fantasies. Other women, 
other mothers possess intimate knowledge of my daughter. Early portrait studios equipped with skylights depended on sunny skies to bathe sitters in light, a flood required to coax an image from recalcitrant emulsions. I imagine the day Godesse was born, the sun warming her skin, its rays eventually finding mine, our skies touching. I speak of her family, but I am thinking of her biological mother. The detachment of this term troubles me. Its clinical accuracy exacts another disavowal. I want to give her a name that doesn't reduce her to her reproductive function. She's even more elusive than the child to whom I write, a shimmering that never coalesces, never coalesces into an image. Even a hidden mother is accorded a veil, her concealment a tacit acknowledgment of her power. The claims of the women who gave birth to Goddesse terrify me. I tentatively rehearse the authority of my own claim. I am her mother, not hidden, legible. Because I am white, it's a sentence I will have to declare over and over again. That's the public, and here's what I reserve. The fact of our difference, that our bodies do not match, will be a reminder of future separations. In August, I should explain something very quickly. Um, so during this interval like of seven months, the families that would travel to Addis Ababa, where my daughter was, um, they would take photographs of the other children at the transition house. And so you really, I really lived for these photographs. So it was about a two month interval between when I got that first photograph that I, um, that I described and when I got the, sort of the second set of photographs. So, in August, I received this report with photographs from a mother who's recently returned from Addis Ababa. Gotta say, oh my word, what a sweetheart. She kept doing the funniest scrunchy smile. I was cracking up. When I was going through pics, my sister saw her and said, her mom is just going to fall in love with her. I can guarantee that. She's stunning. The images show her plump and boisterous flirting with the woman who's taking her picture. I can see her new baby teeth through her big smile. She's got a little pot belly and her arms are filling out. She makes the scrunchy smile, a skeptical and playful look, an expression I recognize as one of my own. She's changed dramatically in two months and she doesn't look sick. I sob with relief and happiness. I see a thinker, a comedian, a coquette, a radiant and fierce girl. I will not reproduce the image here. It is only for me. Dismantle birth and make something new. In its beginnings, love is an act of invention, a leap bridging the distance between two people. Adoption reinscribes the notion of kin because it takes that distance as a given, a space filled with potential because it has been traversed. Every mother meets her child for the first time. We will see and hold one another and part and stare. Our differences aren't a fault line, but a seam slowly stitched together. My impulse to intellectualize to distance skirts the heat of my longing. If I claim ours as a story of invention, I cast Goddesse as Athena, emerging fully rendered from my head, a triumph of mind over body. Who am I kidding here? I fantasize her body in my arms and feel her frame press into me. I can't breathe. Racking sobs, mucus caught in my throat. No blood, no viscera. My body cleaved all the same. It took an ax to free Athena from Zeus's skull, her birth rendered an act of violent creation. But it was her hidden mother, Metis, who forged her helmet and shield. So now we're skipping ahead. Um, this passage I'm going to read is um, when I when I brought Goddesse back to the hotel um, in Otis. So her hair has been gathered into puffs, and she's nibbling on a teething biscuit. I photograph her with the nanny. I want to document this woman, one of many. 
I add a little. I want to photograph, I want to document this woman, one of many who have also loved her. The camera makes her shy and she cuddles into her nanny's arms. Then I take her into my arms and awkwardly struggle to get her into the baby carrier. We walk from the room through the courtyard and out the door into the streets. I'm nervous. I've been briefed that Ethiopians are sensitive on the subject of Western adoption and the agency advises families to not appear in public with their children. I've been assured that the short walk back to Ritmo is safe. Her crying stops the moment we leave the compound. She looks at everything. The details swell and rush. A woman selling potatoes piled in a mound on a blanket spread on the dirt road. School children in their rumpled uniforms orbiting and brushing by, pretending not to look. A man begging, he draws close, letting his hand hover inches above her head, nodding, conferring a blessing. More children, their aggression unfiltered, asking for candy and money. We arrive at the gates of Ritmo and greet the security guard, Salam, a passage completed. I take her into my room to change her clothes, as if dressing her in the clothes I've brought will ease the transition. I discover the beauty mark on her chest. The first night, she wakes at 3 o'clock, and I take her out of her crib. She climbs on top of my body and falls back asleep. I am astonished by the blind force of her need. I can't move her without her sobbing. Her fingers reach for me. They have a life of their own, and there's no gentleness in her touches. She twists, she twists the skin on my neck and kneads my breasts. Her fingers claw at my lips and reach into my mouth, scraping my palate. I keep waking, panicked, convinced that I'm suffocating. Skin to skin, call me mama. Gotta say is not shy in front of the camera anymore, but its slow shudder can't keep up with her velocity. I struggle to reconcile the demands of mothering her with my impulse to document. I stand apart, considering the light, sweet-talking my subject and framing the scene. The distance between us shrinks and swells. I have very few pictures of us together except for the portraits we make with my laptop. In her early days home, this was the only way I could photograph her, us, with the screen acting as a mirror. Sitting in my lap, she would stare in wonder at our faces, then turn toward me. My arms around her, the moment of perfect quietness. Someday, I will tell God to say this secret. When we first met, I hesitated to pick her up, pausing at the threshold when we became real. I was ready to emerge to become her mother, and I was terrified. That moment contained many endings and forecast the looping of our future. Maybe she would be happier here. Our life together is filled with joy, but the little losses prick and wound every day. When I leave her at school, when she runs toward her friends, when she strays just out of my sight, when I watch her sleep, when I forget about her, and when I remember again. I dread the prospect of letting God to say go into the world, but she's already there. Thank you. So you heaped our plate, both of you. It's really inspiring to be here for me. Um, I just want to say a couple of things initially, and then I have some questions for both of you. Um, uh, just a couple of things. First, that um, Mark um, has been, I think, enormously important to my world and to the world of photography. He's somebody who I've been following f off and on for, I think the first thing I read by you was, I think, your book on McDermott and McGuff. Would have been around 2000, maybe? 98. 98. And um, that was enormously important to me because it helped set me on a path to write about old process photography and to write about photography more broadly and to think about the possibilities of integrating the past and the present in, in contemporary artistic practice. Uh, it turns out that. Um, that Laura was also important in a similar way for me, uh, much later. And when she did her first essay in Cabinet on Hidden Mothers, that's when I, she really came to my attention. I'm, I knew some of the people who were influential for her, but not her work directly. 
Um, and when I saw her work, or certainly saw the cabinet essay on, um, on the hidden mother images, that kind of went viral, actually. Since I'd been thinking about old process photography, I'd been thinking a lot about uh, a kind of central problem, which is kind of what's the next step? Um, how do we integrate this kind of interest in the past or interest in photographic practices which are have become antiquated into a more contemporary practice. And the way she was thinking about the tintype, the way she was also incorporating into her own work kind of aspects of the theatricality of sort of earlier photographic practices, was, I, I thought was enormously important as a way of starting to think about how to make the past contemporary, which is something basically what artists do. So both of the people on the stage have been important to me, and it was really moving for me to be able to see their work kind of um, in a package, you might say. So when I, I was asked to, to be able to talk to both of them, uh, I've got a lot of questions for both of them. They need to sign books, so I have to kind of think about what what I don't want to have have you talk about and what I really do because I only have you for a few minutes. Um, I think it would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about St. Lucie books and about how the two of you came to work through this process of making the books. Um, and I, I guess I suppose we sh I should talk to Mark first about the origin of St. Lucie books, and and then I, I'd be very interested to see how Laura got kind of brought into the fold on this, because these are beautiful books. They're really well done, and you set a high bar for you know, publication uh, of what are essentially serious and thought-provoking work around photography. Uh, sure, thank you so much, Lyle. Um, real quick, um, you know, I've been started a website, St. Lucie, about five, six years ago. Um, basically as a way to archive, you know, some of the things I'd written that were in obscure publications, but also as a freelance writer, I would propose articles and essays uh, to various publications, and oftentimes I would say, yeah, it's a little weird, no. So, um, and I thought, well, I should write it anyway. And, um, and so the idea was just to start a kind of online journal. And so it's become, you know, something that I've spent a lot of time on the last six years, and it has lots of essays and conversations and portfolios and that kind of thing. So I don't know. I wasn't thinking of uh, starting <laughs> St. Lucie books. <laughs> I was. Sh I had finished a draft of Twenty Seven Contacts and was shopping it around. And and you sent it to me. I remember you sent me. Yeah, a PDF, I sent you an early. Really, yeah. I wanted wanted your help, Lyle. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it was like it was. It's a. It's a. The text is in between. It's in between. It's not. It's not a criticism. It's not art history. It's not a monograph. It's not in all of those things. I think in some ways, um, and it's and it's deeply personal. So you know, the academic presses were like, well, it's uh, going to be expensive, and it's not scholarly. And um, some of the art presses were like, well, this is not a monograph, and it's not criticism. And so it was that kind of thing. So online, I saw Laura was doing a Kickstarter campaign, and I decided to get in, and I, I didn't know her, Laura. I mean, I, we had mutual friends. I knew of her work from the cabinet, and actually Bernie had told me about her years before and that we should meet, and, but we had never met. And um, so I just contacted her and said, hey, what are you, can I talk to you about your Kickstarter? What are you doing with it? And I asked her, so what are you doing? Who's publishing your book? And she said, uh, no one. And I said, <laughs> why not? And she said, in th what she said was the responses that she was getting were basically the same responses I had been getting. It's too odd, it's eccentric, we don't know what to do with it. And, and do, have, do we have hit lists of all the people that we... No, 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 no. <laughs> it's completely understandable. It's hard to sell books. You know, they're expensive. There's, you know, there's lots of good reasons why people said no. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know, just soon after that, I remember uh, I was just thinking... I could publish Laura's book. Oh, I could publish my own book. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, St. Lucie books, boom, and that was it. I mean, it really was set sort of quick. It was like one little epiphany after another, and I thought, I saw my future opening. I, it, it was, it was, I, was, I pivoted in that moment. I pivoted from despair to hope. 
I mean, it really is what happened. I mean, because uh, that's I was super like, important. no one will publish my damn book. Fuck you all. And, um, and I just suddenly was like, oh, wait, this can happen. You know? And since I'm from a DIY background in the first place, it sort of made a lot of sense. You know? and, um, and it seemed to make sense with what I had been doing with St. Lucie, that it could be something extend the mission of St. Lucie. So that's the sh short version of it. Yeah, well, I'm from Laura's, from your perspective as, as this person who was also going through this kind of frustrating experience, which needless to say is common to all three of us. Um, your contact, with, did you mar know Mark's work? Did you know St. Lucie? Because you mentioned, you know, that you knew, I mean, you had connect, yet you had been thinking about him, certainly as a, maybe as a writer and... and yeah, well, I knew St. Lucie very well. I used it quite frequently with my teaching and you know one of the things I valued about it was it wasn't the right the writing you know it reflected a kind of sensibility that I thought was you know kind of necessary right like the sort of the ways in which um you know sort of autobiography played you know played a role in criticism and you know he has he just has a great sensibility and I liked that it wasn't sort of ruled by um well, certainly not ruled by the market, but it just kind of, it goes where it goes. And so I really, I direct my students to it because because of its sensibility and because it doesn't, its lack of orthodoxy. So, um, and I had invited Mark to do a Skype interview with my grad students. And so then I really got a kind of deeper sense of his um his his history as an artist and a writer. So I, I did feel in that. In that interview, like I kind of got to know you a little bit. So, when we had this conversation, it was—I mean, I'm so used to doing things on my own, and just the fact that he was kind of like, "Hey, let's do this thing," and I was like, "Hey, sure, you know, like why not?" Because here I wrote a book, and I didn't think I could do that, right? So, it was for me, it was just like having a pal in in the process. And yeah, it's like it's like, hey, there's a barn. Let's put on a musical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, uh, the other thing that struck me, and the reason why both of these books have turned out to be, and I, I just read them, you know, I read them when I was away. I was traveling, and I just kind of gobbled them up, you know, in, in, in what time I had when I was traveling. I thought, you know, because they, they were both very compelling to read in completely different ways. And for people who don't have the book or have not yet read either of these books, uh, I find it enormously interesting that they are they do express very different people who are dealing with material in quite different ways. Marx is sort of as as you've already seen, it's a combination of essay, travelogue, sort of personal narrative. Um, Laura's is something that's also unclassifiable. It kind of goes between an essay on historical process and thinking through those kinds of issues and this incredibly intense kind of emotional period in her life where she is, in a sense, intro being introduced to motherhood or introducing herself to another human being at this level. So there's a lot of stuff going on. What I was struck by, both as a writer and as somebody who thinks a lot about the issues that, that you, you both are involved in, is this problem of a search for a form. And it's, it's particularly, it seems to me, pertinent now because I think most of the best writing in photography is uh, comes from a very personal place. I mean, we've it seems to me, and you can con correct me if I'm wrong, but we've moved out of a period where the kind of heavy theorizing that has characterized past writing on photography has been, in a sense, kind of absorbed. And it's been taken in by people who are thinking about images and people who are writing about them and the search for a form, a very personal way of engaging images in our own past and what images do to us has, is really the name of the game. So I was thinking about all the people who are models, people who come up in your own thinking and your books, and inevitably their approach is to find a form or a voice for the work that they're doing. It's distinctive and that never moves away from who they are. And I, I just wanted to ask you both about your own progress as writers and, and, and the search for a form and, and what that entailed. Uh, Mark and I have talked a little bit about this, at least briefly in the past, but I'm really interested to hear 
Laura, you talk about that because it seems to me in your book, the pressure on the language is, is intense. You're, you're really kind of, there are things the words need to do and you've done, uh, I think, an amazing thing in getting them to do that. And I just wanna, want you both to talk about the process a little bit. Well, Camera Lucida was the point of departure. And it's central to both of your books. Yeah, absolutely, like. absolutely. Um, so the structure of my book is totally you know, indebted to, to that book. Um, and that book is about the loss of his mother and trying to sort of find this defining image. And I just, you know, I sort of took that structure and thought about, you know, his sort of notions of photography and time and loss and just kind of transcribe them to sort of think about the ways in which time and loss and photography figured in largely into my experience of becoming a mother through adoption. So, you know, I wouldn't be here if that book hadn't been written. Um, and also the ways in which, you know, he uses photographs. And of course, you know, the, the central thing is he never shows the Winter Garden photograph, the photograph of his mother. And yeah, a so, strategy that both of you adopt in your books. Right. There are pictures that you refuse to show, and I, I hope we can talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other thing is I'm actually a pretty deeply reserved person, so to, act, to write a book that is about, you know, one of the most intense emotional periods of my life, you know, I lost my mother in this, you know, during this time, um, you know, <laughs> I, need, I needed some refuge in which I could withhold things, and so that was another sort of lesson I took from that book. Um, another book that was really important to me is Maggie Nelson's Bluettes. And again, like that was a book that sort of has a kind of chapter form that sort of works with time in a particular way. It works with a kind of, um, what's the word I want to use? Um, disclosure, but at the same time, just kind of, you know, there, there's a vast amount of reserve in that book, even as much as, as it she reveals, right? And so that book totally gave me license. And, you know. In terms of a way to write as well, because is it one of, something I want to talk to Mark about? Just the sound of the words, the way they work together? Or was it more about that reticence and revelation? Well, reticence and revelation, but also that, you know, all of these things could be in a book. Like I could write about my daughter, I could write about. You know, I could write about tin types. I could write about hidden mothers. That, you know, and and this comes, you know, also from like kind of really learning a great deal from creative nonfiction in general, like in the last five years. So, in some ways, that's more of my model than thinking about this as a photography book. And of yeah, course, absolutely. this sort of yeah. was why I had a hard time kind of pitching it to publish to presses. And you know, I understand why they didn't want it, but. Um, <laughs> I don't think, you know, I felt like I was, I felt like I was teaching myself how to write while I wrote this book. And I didn't have like a kind of easy kind of pitch for it. But, you know, the Maggie Nelson, um, I'm totally spacing out on the book now, but Catherine Taylor's book about her, do you remember Catherine Taylor's books? Do you, no, sorry. She, it's a, she's a friend of mine. She wrote this amazing book about, um, South Africa and her, her family's history in South Africa. Is that uh, Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight? Not that one. No. No. Okay. Mm -mm. Sorry. I'll, I'll remember the minute I step off the stage. So. Oh, am I, I answering that? Um, I, before I forget, um, I just want to uh, give a shout out to Gannette Abraham, who designed both books. Yeah, beautiful. Um, she's a dream to work with, the loveliest of humans. Um, and uh, she t she just embraced both books and had uh, just really very subtle and lovely things to bring to the table in terms of uh, trying to make these these things happen. So I think a, a lot of uh, credit goes to her. Um, you know, it's funny you should mention Maggie Nelson because uh, she was huge for me. And uh, actually, St. Lucy is called St. Lucy because of Maggie Nelson. Did I ever tell you that story? 
Um, <laughs> so when I was thinking of starting a website, I was like, I uh, would stay up late at night uh, thinking of domain names and then searching <laughs> for them. And all the good ones were gone, you know, like MaggieNelson.com. <laughs> yeah, that was the first one I looked for. But I had all these like really li like you know light box. <laughs> I know that Stephen will laugh at me <laughs> because I was like had the most obvious names for like a photo website. I was like, well, light box is taken. How about Caja de Luz? <laughs> <laughs> it's also taken. Um, but so I came up with really bad ones, like Luminous Flux. And I would stay up late till... I don't even... I think that's an antacid thing, right? It's for like, you know... Um, and I, would, I bought like 20 domain names of the worst possible names for a website. <laughs> and I was reading Bluets at the time. And uh, there's this... Uh, <laughs> And I was, there's this one section, and she starts talking about St. Lucy, you know? And I was like, St. Lucy, you know, the patron saint of sight, blindness, um, Lucy, Lux, light, camera Lucida. It all starts to fit in, you know? And it just goes like, St. Lucy, that's it. And, um, and the thing about Maggie's work, I mean, is that it's, yeah, personal, it's tough, it's uh, rigorous, and uh, it's episodic. Um, you know, it creates, it has a kind of collage-like accumulative power, especially that book, right? Um, so I think that was hugely influential on me as well. But of course, you know, the thing about um, Camera Lucida and the reason, I mean, as a teacher of photography, uh, Camera Lucida or Susan Sontag's art, uh, essays on photography, even though in some ways they can be a little dated or whatever, um, they're still vital for for the reason that, uh, for their humanity, you know, and for their openness and therefore accessibility, um, and for their um, willingness to go to places that maybe are unpopular, or I just, I just found, and so as um, somebody who's interested in demystifying um, uh, obscure, you know, aspects of art and art making, you know, in my teaching, the accessibility is super important to me. And so that's just been a goal of mine um, always. And, you know, to be honest, I mean, you know, some, I mean, I've been influenced by other writers, you know, Flusser or whomever, but sometimes I'm like, I have to really dig at that stuff to kind of get, you know, little nuggets. And I often feel very dumb, you know, when I'm reading some of that material. And um, I certainly don't uh, want to have any of my readers feel dumb, you know. <laughs> um, I, I just, I just, accessibility is very important. I'm still thinking about my Aunt Roberta, actually. I'm like, exactly. if Roberta can can read it, you know, then I'm, I feel like, you know, I've succeeded. Yeah. Well, I mean, it raises a kind of a related issue here, um, and that is one of the things that we, we've seen from the excerpts both of you have read. Uh, and I have a whole bunch marked in my copies, but I'm not going to inflict that because you've already, as I said, heaped our plate, was that this negotiation that both of you have to work between what are essentially very kind of fundamental and abstract concepts or ideas uh, and that thing that's absolutely personal and very particular to you and working out a language for that. I mean, Laura, you said you were learning how to write almost as you did the book. And that kind of pressure comes through loud and clear. I, I sense something very similar in, um, in Mark's book as well, that you're working out sort of how you're going to tell this story, which is actually a fairly long one, um, and obviously very complicated. It involves your family. It involves your past. It involves your your ideas, your, and especially the chapter on Larry Sultan, you're constantly negotiating between the abstract and the theoretical and this thing that's more accessible and personal. And I don't know what else to say about that it's, except that, you know, how did you both become writers? You're photographers, you're, you're visual artists. How did that happen? I was an English major. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the last refuge of the scoundrel. I know all about yeah. that. Um, so, technically, I knew how to write already. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, I, you know, actually, this other thing, you're, for me, it's not that much of a negotiation. I think my introduction to critical theory as a student and then, you know, the ways in which it's fed my practice as an artist and as a writer, like, they don't, I, I, I mean, it's always given me a way to kind of, like, understand the world, you know, and it's especially true for Camera Lucida, and I think, you know, that's, it's a work that I, I feel like, it's like a gift of recognition, like the more and more and more I read it. And so, and that's true for a lot of other, a lot of other writers. I just lost track of your question. That's your oh, so how did I, oh. Enough. I mean, what you've told me is that there is no separation among the various yeah. aspects of what you do. But I think, like, the writing, I mean, I'd always wrote. I always wrote about my work, and it was sort of part of my process for making photographs and making videos. Um, and, like, on, on some level, I, you know, I became a parent, you know, I was a single mother by choice, and, you know, I had reconciled the fact that in doing that I was probably not going to make art for a while but you know and I and I still have this problem you know I I I got of course once it was happening like I was like oh you know like I it, like a loss to not be making work and that's yeah, talking about it and doing it are two different things right and that's why I started writing and it really it really was like a kind of lifeline to making things which you know it took me a really long time to write that book so um um, I guess I've always felt like a writer to some extent. I mean, um, reading was my first uh, sort of escape and passion. And uh, I think when I was 11 or 12, I started writing, you know, stories in the style of the things that I was reading, you know, like mystery stories and science fiction stories, that kind of thing. So you can do it, right? <laughs> With my little big pen and my, you know, loose leaf um, uh, pa blue lined paper. Um, I remember asking my mom if I, there was a really emphatic scene when the, when the characters in my story encountered um, a skeleton sitting on the <laughs> on the sofa. <laughs> Wait, how old? How old I was eleven, uh, yeah. um, and uh, it was like a very dramatic moment. And I remember as because uh, I was going to Catholic school, and uh, I asked, and I was an altar boy too. And so um, I asked my mom if I could use the word "damn" in my story because I wanted it to be a very emphatic moment. And I asked her permission. She said yes. <laughs> but I guess, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I've just wanted to do things that I wanted to do. I wanted to participate. I wanted to be part of the conversation. So, you know, writing or then, you know, playing music um, and then photography. Uh, and But writing was always there, you know. So um, I loved writing when I was in school. And um, when I was in graduate school and after graduate school, I was continuing to write uh, for little publications, writing reviews and that sort of thing, little essays. Um, and then after, in 1999, 2000, I just, I felt this very, I had this I guess, minor epiphany where I felt like I didn't have any images left in me, you know, to make pictures. Um, and so I just stopped. And I have no regrets about that. I, just, I feel like I'm an artist to my bones. But I just started to concentrate on writing. And I had, was doing, starting this major project on, on Maya Deren at the time and um, doing research and trying to write a book about her. Uh, I tried twice. Uh, they were both terrible. Um, but nevertheless, I think I got better in that process, right? And then things that came about, like Jimmy Durham and the McDermott Goff project. And but I, you know, was writing here and there for different magazines, and um, so it just became. And, and being a teacher, a full-time teacher, I'm always in expository mode. I'm always like, and then this, and then this, and then this. It's always about storytelling to some extent, and so I feel just sort of locked into that. Um, and so um, my writing became more and more like that as well. Uh, since we're on the subject, um, I don't know how to put this gently. It de <laughs> depends on how, how honest we want to be with each other. Um, I, I, it, there, there are a couple of things that struck me as enormously, I don't know what the right word is, not problematic exactly, but that are mysterious to me about both of your books. 
And it's not that I was looking for hidden things or I was looking for missing things, um, but, but there were intimations, let's put it that way, that started to come to me through the books. Um, and maybe I can start with Mark first. Uh, and I think I mentioned this to you maybe over the phone, when I saw you or over the phone. And, and it has to do with a kind of ruefulness or a reflective character about the book uh, that, well, you, you'll have to read it, go through it, see how it feels to you, feel how it sounds and feels on your skin. But there's a lot of reflecting in your book about the person that you were. And that person is an artist, person who makes images. And it's written, this book is written from the perspective of a person who clearly doesn't make those images anymore. And it, it gives the book uh, a cast, a feeling. Um, I wonder if you talk a little bit more about that. I mean, there's wonderful stuff, uh, descriptions of your, you know, the work that you made, um, and some of it's kind of silly, or some of it is what it is. What it is, some of it's wonderful. You include some pictures, kind of like you're tantalizing us. You're saying, "I made this. This was who I am." Not too clear whether you think the work's any good or not. Not too clear whether that's even important. Not too clear how much you want to tell us about that. But I was constantly drawn in, and then pushed away because of the way you were, you were writing. I wonder if that was a strategy of yours, was it conscious, or just, I want to get inside your head and see how you deal with your, that long history that you've given us in this, in this rich book. Um, I don't know, I have to think while I'm talking, which is always probably a bad idea, but, um, <laughs> you know, I'm skeptical of myself, primarily, and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I was trying to tell a story. I mean, it is episodic. I didn't start out with this idea, I'm going to tell us, you know, there's going to be this sort of meta-narrative over the, you know, it is sort of episodic and fragmentary, but it's always involved with this idea of trying to be in the world and be an artist and be part of culture and trying to find a voice. Um, and, uh, you know, there's circumstances that sort of, you know, shape that, um, you know, the family I grew up in, the place I grew up in, the time I grew up in, um, and, uh, and then, you know, my attempts to sort of be ha find a voice in the art world. Um, and there were other personal things that were going on, you know, um, I don't know, not to be honest, like alcohol abuse, for instance, <laughs> um, which colored, you know, big sections of my life, you know, in terms of my um, obsessions uh, and my, I would call at this point, self-indulgence. It's not to dismiss everything that I made. In fact, I, some things I made at, during those periods are interesting to me, but I'm not that person, you know, and, uh, and I feel like in some ways they were colored or weakened or um, in some ways compromised by some of the personal things that were going on. And I wanted to be honest about that without being completely self-indulgent, right? But also talk about, like again, like how trying to be an artist and trying to make images is part and parcel of a, of a life. Um, it's not this separate activity, at least not for me, you know, um, that my um, economic and my emotional and my psychological states are, uh, affect, you know, the kinds of things I'm making, the things I'm drawn to, um, my limitations and my obsessions. Yeah, and, and I felt that. I mean, one feels it, and I don't know if Laura felt it as well. Uh, there's a lot more for me to say about that, just because in my own search for a form, I'm thinking about how personal I can afford to be. Um, in, in Laura's case, and I want I, 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 again, I don't know how I can, how much I can do this without prying. Um, uh, both of you have a strategy where there are pictures that you don't show us. There's 10 pages in your book where there are no pictures. They are described but not shown. There's a particular picture that Mark talks about that is not shown, and it's a picture of Beatrice, I think, mm -hmm. okay? And you're very explicit about telling us in this kind of Roland Bard kind of way, I can't show you that picture because it wouldn't mean anything to you. 
Well, I mean, it is a nod to Barth for sure. Um, but uh, what I say, I'm talking about my wife Bea, and uh, and I say that I'm not satisfied with a single image I've ever taken of her because her light is not transferable. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I got a lot of points for that one. <laughs> But it was true. <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, I think it's true. You know, I don't. It's just has to do with love, and you know, and um, you know, and like, can an image be what you want it to be? You know, in that case. Yeah. yeah so I mean, I wonder, Laura, if you, and again, I'm, we need to sign books and do all that. But if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about, I know it's strange, but talk about your own reticence in this process. Y you've set some boundaries for us. Um, there, are some, there are people missing in the book that I wanted to know more about. Uh, and uh, how did you negotiate that? What were you thinking? You're, what are you like as a person in terms of like how much you're willing to express of yourself? What are the limits, the boundaries that you were kind of negotiating? Well, so one of the things that I think both of our books have in common and I think why I was drawn to work with Mark is, I don't, and I don't even know if anyone's ever written about this, but you know, it's, you know, to be a good writer, you have to be a good reader. And I think to be a good photographer, you have to sort of know how to look at ima images and like really deeply engage. And so like the way for me to do that is to write about these images. So, uh, you know, and I really, and again, and when I talk about like teaching myself how to write, and that's something I do all the time with, with teaching, but to sort of turn that towards the kinds of, you know, the images of my family, and in particular right. images of my daughter who I hadn't met yet, and there were photographs taken by other people who I didn't know, you know, for me it was a way to kind of I don't know, it was like a way to practice something that I was teaching, and it was also a way to kind of get at this way that my I was becoming attached to her, right? Absolutely. And, um, and, you know, there are many sort of intense, complicated ethical issues around international adoption, and ultimately, you know, the ultimate boundary for me was this is a book about this particular interval of my life. I don't, I'm not going to disclose anything about God to say that, you know, in the future she might not want disclosed. So, you know, so there's that kind of like practical ethical boundary for me, but then, you know, much in the way that like if you set a certain kind of limitation for yourself and you think of that as a way to kind of be productive, like, and that was really productive for me to sort of, I mean, I literally would like, write these sort of like descriptions of all of the photographs and that was you know how I sort of got to you know that one section that you referred to and you know hopefully again like the sort of sense of like you know I would look at these pictures and it was like you I just wanted to like pull so much out of them but of course like ultimately it's just a picture right you know and so I on some level writing about them kind of got got to that that tension and that sort of that sort of sense of frustration and loss that you know I sort of experienced in looking at those pictures so yeah and I uh, maybe that's a good in a way it's a good conclusion for me because you know you both referenced Roland Barthes and of course in in Mark's book a lot of other writers as well like you say people who are somewhat in some cases very theoretical other in other cases, very novelistic. Um, it seems to me that in the process, certainly in my process of reading both your works, and from what you've said about the way you've written them, uh, it was very much about coming to a much more fundamental understanding of images and photographs particularly than, than whatever you'd experienced before, that the process of writing this really moved you both to a very different place or a new level in terms of your your own kind of connection to photographs as, like you say, as living documents, as kind of versions of living things. And maybe if we could just kind of conclude with your own sense about photography now, 
or photographs now <laughs> after this process that you've foolishly put yourselves through? Or maybe there's nothing to say about that. I'll, I'll just say that, um, I don't know if I can answer that question, except to say that um, uh, as somebody who, uh, you know, loves photography, loves books, loves teaching, um, and, um, you know, have always wa I've always wanted to be part of the conversation, whatever form, that, whatever level. Um, to me, when I look at these two books, um, I just think they belong. <laughs> they belong to the literature of photography. Um, and I've, in our own ways, I feel like we've contributed to the field in a way that I hope is inspiring, accessible, and uh, um, gives people, other people permission to write their stories and to involve, because you know, as as I think I suggested in my reading uh, about Larry, it's like the photograph doesn't end once you take the picture. You know, that's really in some ways just the beginning. I mean, we can animate photographs, bring them back to life. We can resuscitate them. Um, they could be long lost images in some dusty drawer someplace, and then we can bring them back to life. And um, that relationship uh, where if you animate an image, the in image animates you in return, that reciprocity is um, essential. I mean, it's like fundamental to how I operate in the world and how I interact with art and literature and human beings, you know. Um, so a conversation, you know, between you and I or Laura and I or any of the many lovely people in this room is uh, one of the great pleasures in life is like just, you know, animating each other through just like, what, what do you think of that? And I think of this and that, that back and forth. And I feel like to, that art does that or can do that, has the potential to do that. And what I wanted for my book, and I think Laura's book does this as well, which is just to take something that is you know deeply felt and carefully considered and um, a beautiful object and goes into the world and hopefully um, contributes to and, and empowers I hate that word but you know um, inspires other people to kind of take it on um, but also to grow the literature you know um, in a way that is brings it to maybe calls carves out some other territory. Um, I could never, I never would compare myself to Barth or Sontag or any of these greats, right? Um, but I do feel like in my own way I've processed the materials uh, and my own experiences. And, and I, one last thing, just that as a maker, as a photographer, I, <laughs> I think that's important as well. It's like I learned photography. I made fo many, many, many photographs. And um, I think seeing the medium from the inside is really part of what I have to offer as well. And I think that's true for Laura's book. Well, my daughter's eight now, so I am making photographs again, which is pretty exciting. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting your questions. <laughs> 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 um, I think it just maybe to return to something you said at the beginning. There's you know been a kind of resurgence of interest in um, sort of 19th century processes. You know this kind of return to analog, and you know my interest in it I is m more conceptual in some ways, and I think the sort of process of writing this book has has been really instrumental in what I'm doing now in my studio. Um, I'll also just say that the experience, you know, there's huge sections of the book that came out, but there was a kind of lengthy section about um, race and sort of talking about the sort of the shift in analog materials, you know, from the 19th to 20th century. and. Um, that's something that's still of interest to me that um, hopefully I'll keep working on. So. Uh, I want to thank both of you. Uh, f again, uh, both of these books are wonderful books. They've been, uh, again, they continue to be important to me. And just want to add one thing as a writer, that um, both books seem to me had to have engaged b uh, um, a level of risk and involvement or commitment 
Uh, that's really rare in contemporary writing. Uh, and there's nothing gained without that level of risk. So I appreciate what both of you have given us. And you'll be able to pr participate in this directly because they are signing books and everybody should get on board. Okay. So thank you. Thanks, Lyle. Are we going to do Q and A? I mean, I don't know, yeah, just yeah. for a couple of minutes. I mean, I'm sorry to keep you. Just go if you need to go. <laughs> um, there are microphones in the audience, I think. Um, I mean, that's what I think. Yeah, there's a question over here. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for Laura. Is that your name? Um, I was wondering about the women in the pictures of the children from like looks like from the end of the 19th century who you know were covered up and it reminded me of um, something that I'd seen a long time ago there was a, a book of photographs of post-mortem photography 19th century of you know they would take photographs of people right after they died and there were a lot of pictures of women holding their deceased children in their arms as if they were sleeping and do you think maybe the living children they didn't photograph the mothers but the living the living children didn't get photographed of their mothers because holding the baby would be m too much like a postmortem photograph of this tradition of photographing the baby sleeping, <coughs> eternal sleep with the mother? Or is there... Well, I think the postmortem photographs were... They, they served two functions. They, did, they, were, they were portraits of the children and then they had not made a portrait of them when they were alive. But I think they also... They were mourning photographs and that's why the mothers weren't concealed. And I should mention that, you know, this vernacular is referred to as hidden mother, but, it, you know, there are, there are images, you know, it could be the assistant, it could be, you know, there are, there are hidden father photographs, you know. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a designate, it's a convenient designation. And I guess the way I sort of ended up writing about it was, less like about a kind of role and more about a kind of labor, right? And sort of, you know, and then how that labor is, um, you know, marginalized essentially. So they were covered because they could make a photograph like just of the child, right? Um, you know, it was a moment where photography was becoming inexpensive enough that you didn't have to sort of like get everybody in the picture. Uh, thank you. Uh, I couldn't help thinking of the old adage, one picture is worth a thousand words. And how did it apply to both of you that I just couldn't fathom the thousand words because your words meant so much more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Yeah, this work makes me think both sort of works and all of the works within each of your works makes me think of this idea of co-performative witnessing that performance study scholar Dwight Conkergood has crystallized performative witnessing as this co-performative witnessing as this idea where there's a sharing between the dancerly subject in this performance studies context and the people who are you know, dancing with this ethnographer, this person who's closely studying this group in some kind of a way. So I think in a lot of ways, okay, so zooming back from performance studies, like sort of to this exact you know, frame in which we're in, photography. So I think that there's a lot of destabilization of this sort of um, hierarchy of subject and you know this, the gaze upon the subject. And it seems that you guys are doing a co-performative witnessing in different ways with your works. Um, 
and kind of shaking up this hierarchy in that way. What do you think of that? In terms of the writing, so when you talk about co-performative witnessing, the ways in which we're acting as as critics and subjects within the the text. Yeah, and also how you're sort of breaking apart the idea of you know the mother being sort of you know this um, objectified <coughs> kind of thing, this sort of like um, limited figure. You're you're taking you're taking that apart in a lot of different ways. I think. Um. Well, it's interesting because she actually isn't objectified because there's so much work being done to remove her from the image. But of course, you know, she is well, a symptom. Like she's there. <laughs> she's there. Well, I mean, she's like objectified into nothingness. Like she's made invisible for me. But, but she's not. That's and that's the thing. And that's she is still there. She is not going anywhere. Like, <laughs> like, like all mothers. <laughs> We don't go anywhere. Well, that's kind of the whole point, you know, to stay in the game. But the intent is not to be in any sort of way in any sort of a, a relationship with her, you know? Well, except that I would say that I did feel like a kind of profound, I mean, identification isn't the right word, but it, like there was a kind of recognition, right? And a kind of recognition of like, what it means to sort of be present and then to kind of be like this. And this is partly because I am someone's daughter and, be, and because I, you know, I had read enough um, parenting, <laughs> parenting books at the time to know that I had to kind of like you know, back off sometimes, mom, right? And so, um, but I mean, I think the, the sort of bigger issue rather than parenting manuals is more like, it was speculative, right? Like it was all speculative. And, you know, and I'm sure this is, there There are aspects of this if you, if you become a parent, you know, if you're pregnant and you give birth to your child. But um, there was this level of speculation which sort of introduced, you know, on one hand, like wanting to kind of identify in some ways and yet being kind of shut out of it. So. Um, and, you know, I'm not familiar with this writer, so I can't sort of speak in a kind of um, informed way, but the idea of being kind of both inside of this thing in a speculative way and, you know, witnessing it or sort of trying to understand it through writing critically about it, yes, so there was a kind of split there. Um, and it's sort of why it made sense to write this book you know, in a way that, um, you know, I'm not a scholar, right? I was not going to write like a sort of scholarly, authoritative text about hidden mother photographs. Um, I'm a I'm a competent enough writer to write about them critically, but ultimately, I was more interested in sort of sort of turning it around and sort of seeing all these different kinds of facets of it. I think I kind of got there. <laughs> Any other questions? There's wait. There's one right here, Paula. Hello, okay. Mark. Like one of my favorite chapter is the chapter about the aura photography that you have, I can't remember the exact title. Blur of the Otherworldly. The Blur of the Otherworldly, but, and for me, it's the first part when you and your friend go off to get your aura photograph, <laughs> and then there's a part of, uh, what's the doctor's name, Archive? And Dr. Eisenbug. Dr. Eisenbug, <laughs> and you know, what I He's love. He's a real guy. <laughs> 
I love is that it's a surprising parallel, but for me, when I read the chapter, made perfect sense for me. I, f I find the poetic in it, but I've, I would like you to talk a little bit about the logic, how these two things came in to be in the same chapter for you, and what, what do you think they do? What, what about having our own aura photo photographs made, and then doc and then uh, yeah. Ted Surya? They're in the same, in the same, and, and that's why you know. And that chapter feels a little bit like a poem when you put these two things that, okay, they connect because of they can very loosely connect under the face of aura photography, but it's so much more than that. I think. Yeah, um, well, the origin of that essay came from, um, I co-curated a show called uh, Blur of the Other World, Art, Technology, and the Paranormal with Jane Marshing, who I taught with at Syracuse for a number of years. And then when she, I moved to Baltimore and she moved to Boston and we wanted to keep working together. So um, we were both, we, had, we shared an office at Syracuse and we had this thing called ATOS, which was all things outer space. So we just loved any, anything that was weird and quirky about, you know, um, you know, that kind of stuff, um, flying saucers and that kind of thing. And so um, uh, we, what, how did it happen? Um, we uh, proposed to do a, a, uh, an article for um, College Art Association, I mean, a, a panel on 19th century, you know, spirit photographs, um, which we did. And then we were asked to guest edit their journal. And so we did, and, and so we did historical. We had asked a number of essays to contribute to that. I think that was 2002 or three or somewhere in there. And then um, we were, started thinking about well, what are contemporary artists doing with um, what kinds of technologies are people using today to kind of investigate the line between the sort of you know the concrete reality and some other otherworldly kinds of experiences. So we started looking into that, and that was sort of the genesis of that project. Um, and in that, in our sort of research, you know, we decided to have our aura photographs made at this um, um, kind of new age expo. Um, but it, you know, it mirrors the whole 19th century tradition of like, you know, using this new technology at the time of photography to try to capture things that aren't there, to use an evidentiary power of photography to prove that there are these spirits, there are these presences, and that the photography as a medium, I mean, think about the term medium, could, you know, kind of act as a kind of conduit between these worlds. Um, so when I was doing that, I had just moved to Baltimore, and I realized uh, that when I was at the university, where I, in the University of Maryland, in their archives, they had this Ted Sirius archive. Ted Sirius was this, as described at the time, an unemployed alcoholic bellhop from Chicago who um, could you know, uh, project images from his mind onto Polaroid film, and he, they were called thotographs. Um, and, uh, so he was, I guess he had some kind of minor celebrity, you know, the interest in the paranormal ebbs and flows over time, you know, and during the 60s, you know, because of mind expansion and, and TM and... Uh, like bending forks. And exactly, Uri Geller and all that stuff. Um, so there was this psychiatrist, I'm telling to him, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's this uh, psychiatrist in Boulder, Colorado named Jewel Eisenbud, and he had an interest in uh, the paranormal. And so he took Ted under his wing and basically for 15 years did a series of tests under you know, strict circumstances to make sure there's no tomfoolery um, and with panels of experts. And while you know, they fed Ted you know, basically bottles of Budweiser and he got progressively drunk and stripped his shirt off and he would act as this kind of urban primitive and then he would project his images from his mind onto the Polaroid. Uh, and they, but they always used a camera, right? And as if, I don't know why they needed a camera, but apparently uh, to focus is, uh, <laughs> but they did anyways. It's a, it's a very interesting story and I'm interested in, I'm, I, I, people ask me, well, is it real? And did he really have those? I don't care at all. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. I doubt it. <laughs> but um, what I'm really like is, um, the uh, aesthetics of the otherworldly, right? Like, how do we uh, how do we imagine the otherworldly through the sort of technologies of representation that we have? And it makes sense, you know. I mean, the first some of the first um, um, uh, mediums were table wrappers, right? 
which you know started like basically four years after the invention of the telegraph, right? So this idea of disembodiment, you know, and using te using technologies of disembodiment to kind of investigate the other world, it makes a lot of sense to me. And so those things, those stories came together. You know, going, we were Jane and I were thinking about this show and what we're going to do, and we went and had our aura photographs made. At the same time, I discovered the Ted Sirius archive, and so it's sort of kind of great that those things you know came together. Um, and then lastly about that, it's just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking too long, but um, what I'm really, I am interested in the, uh, the aesthetics of the other worldly, but I'm really interested in the politics and the, of power between Eisenbud and Ted Sirios, because Ted Sirios was like the urban primitive. He was like a, his- An outsider artist. Yeah, and he was treated like, uh, a, in, he was infantilized by Jules Eisenbud, you know, who just see, saw him as this kind of like, Vulgar, vulgarian, right? But he had certain talents, right? And so it fit into a certain kind of politics of um, class and education, and and uh, I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah, Long-standing artisticness as well, you know, but it's basically a modernist approach to, you know, to sort of the primitive. You know? I just want to say that um, Lyle's book on outsider art, how to look at outsider art. I mean, that's a, a book that many people don't mention when they introduce him. It's fantastic. It's just a really wonderful book. Can I make a quick comment about that? Um, maybe I was um, mind melding with that chapter today. I saw a Personal Shopper, uh, the new OABA in science film. And it's all about Victor Hugo's um, exile. Thank you, Mark. Does, any, does anyone else? We should wrap it up, I think. Is there anyone else? OK. Go ahead. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the baby pictures. Uh, what came to mind is how you obtained them in terms of getting permission and all the legal aspects of uh, personal files know how private they are uh, of adoption families of uh, people breaking into offices trying to find out who their parents are whatever uh, uh, how you obtain those those personal pictures so all of, I had the good fortune of working with a collector two collectors uh, Lee Marks and John Deprez they're they're based in Indiana and they collected the hidden mother photographs for years and years and years. And, you know, it's a little digging on eBay, thrift stores, et cetera. They've been collecting them for 20 years. So a lot of the photographs are from their collection. Um, and she opened up her home. She shared everything. She just gave me full permission. So I was very, very, very fortunate to work with her. Um, some of the photographs are mine, and I acquired them the same way. I have, you know, I've never been able to identify anyone, like, based on things that are written on the back, or, you know, sometimes, like, a cabinet card will have the names of the studios. Um, to be honest, that's not kind of my sort of interest ultimately um but these are all found photographs you know if not by me by by lee and john um and i so far i've never sort of encountered anyone who was like that's, that's my dad you know <laughs> i did have a very strange thing happen where that first image that i showed of the african-american boy um which was the first photograph i bought and i bought it on ebay but a few years later, I was, you know, trolling eBay, and I saw the image again. And so I think it was an image that was probably, um, I'm totally spacing out right now, but, you know, they had cameras with four lenses, and they would sort of 
make four photographs on one plate and then they would cut the plates. So it had to have been like from the same shoot, but it wasn't the same seller, which was so nuts. Um, but there, it was from, it's from New Orleans or, you know, they, both of the dealers were from New Orleans. So. I just wanted to add one thing about that. It's not a response directly, but there, there's a really moving passage in Laura's book. Um, one of the ones that really stuck with me where she takes on the responsibility of making pictures of children in the orphanage in Addis Ababa to send back, and I, I think I've got this right, to send back to, you were deputized essentially, to do the thing that was done for you, which is to send back to people pictures of the children that they are talking about and they are going to adopt. And you recognized how important that was from your own experience. And you got into an overwhelming situation where there you were with all these children. And I mean, you'll have to read it for yourself. It's a, it's a really short passage. It's, I found it enormously moving in terms of what photography can mean, what the responsibilities of image making can be when you're suddenly understanding really what's personally at stake for everybody yeah. involved. It was, it's not something you're going to forget at all when you read it. It's really and, I, and I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do what I was supposed to do, yeah. but it was just I, yeah. Read That's the a, read the book. Yeah, read the book. <laughs> you'll, you'll cut her some slack. I think. <laughs> anyway, thanks again. It was really she and I finally exchanged a few words. Lucky for me, she was interested in photography. And I asked her if she wanted to go see the Joseph Kadelka exhibition that had just opened at the Carpenter Center for the Arts at Harvard. Later that week, after a caf coffee at Cafe Pamplona, we walked up the street and ascended the concrete ramp to Le Corbusier's building, the only design he realized in North America. My first hint at Allison's instinctual creativity was that while I wore the expected punk rock pins on my lapel, she adorned her torn gray t-shirt with a twig of thorns and a black and white snapshot of a girl running through the grass. Born in 1938, Joseph Kadelka is a Czech photographer whose black and white photographs swirl with visceral graininess. Trained as an aeronautical engineer, he worked with theater companies as a photographer, and his early images appear like discarded visions of Samuel Beckett, evocative and malformed. His first long-range project was documenting, documenting Romani life in Romania and Czechoslovakia. In August 1968, he was witness to the Soviet invasion of Prague and applied his alienated vision to the brute force of history. One of his most famous, well-known, one of his most well-known images was taken in a moment before the Russian tanks could be seen, although the threatening rumble could be felt. An arm thrust into the frame from the left, its wrist watch, wrist watch tells us it's 1222, as if to proclaim, this is the exact moment that it happened. In the background, a prominent pra Prague Boulevard fades to a soft blur, an evacuated stage anxiously awaiting the arrival of the oppressor. As a result of these photographs, he was forced to leave his homeland. And although he immigrated to France, he adopted a nomadic life in which the camera was his passport and photography was his home. Kadelka has remarked that photography is a kind of theater for which the play has not been written. His embrace of statelessness has served him to create decades of photographs that act as temporary shelters, rest stops along the road to self-imposed yet permanent exile. Allison and I shuffled from frame to frame, transported by Kadelka's hard-edged lyricism. We were not ready yet to hold hands, but I felt tethered. Acutely aware of our shifting attentions, we were alternately drawn into Kadelka's worlds and then gravitationally pulled back and toward each other. We stood for many minutes in front of an image taken in Spain, 1971, of what appeared to be some kind of feast day or carnival. Several men in dark suits are standing in the play of highlights and long shadows of late afternoon. One man has just released a firework toward the sky, his left hand gesturing in, in the canonical ray of light catching in the smoky trail. It is a holy image, secular and sacred. Its effects seem to extend into the gallery, suffusing us with an, with an aura of possibilities, a bubble of elevated tenderness. Our relationship was born in photography, and our connection evolved as a kind of extended photo shoot. 
suspended between childhood and adulthood, not yet caught in the sticky concerns of career and family. We were actors in our own play, testing identities as if trying on itchy sweaters in a secondhand store. We staged miniature dramas for the sake of being photographed. Photo excursions took us to Provincetown in winter and abandoned factories at night. We traveled to the Yucatan and to Berlin. We photographed ourselves crunching along frozen sand dunes and dreaming lazily in bed. We drove into fields of daylilies during a nocturnal excursion in the Boston suburbs and photographed our silver car as if it had just dropped down from Mars. Meandering around Stonehenge in pale winter light, trying to figure out how to make a picture, we settled on closed eyes and thumb sucking in front of the brooding megaliths. We filled rooms with candles, drank wine, and lit old photographs on fire. With gleeful abandon of photographic rules, we left the camera's shutter open. Too long, we swung the camera in an arc. Like drunken bartenders, we mixed light sources on a quest to pour mind-altering concoctions, combining the warmth of tungsten with the sickly green of fluorescent, the cool constancy of daylight with flickering yellow flame. Sometimes they produce surprising results. <clears throat> I photographed a group of men digging out a tree root in the front yard at night. The orange glow of the headlights mixed with my camera's flash to reveal a portal to the underworld, as if Lucifer himself had made the image. The picture was fiery and clotted with fragmented bodies. The camera inspires a performative attitude. To be imaged is to, be, is to participate in an infinite process of replication, to be made inauthentic, an artifact of surfaces. Like Adam and Eve reneg renegotiating self-consciousness, we embraced the expulsion and cultivated theatricality instead. We were unashamed. Thinking of ourselves innocent outcasts, we invented a photographic universe of our own romantic statelessness. Photography was our anchor, our communion, our validating ritual, connecting us to each other, to the present ecstatic moment, and to a history of image makers we considered our aesthetic ancestors. Every release of the shutter was an unspoken bow to Kadelka, to Robert Frank, to Andre Cortez, to Julia Margaret Cameron, and a host of other photographic celestials. Okay, that's, so that's from Falling in Love with Kadelka. It's longer, but that's all I'm reading from that. So this essay is um, for Larry Sultan, who is my teacher at the San Francisco Art Institute. And each chapter starts with a little quote. This one's from Larry. Like a ventriloquist who laughs at his dummy's jokes, I keep trying to make photographs that seduce me into believing in the image, although time knowing better, but believing anyway. My faith in photography as a path forward deepened. Not, no longer was it only about making pictures. I wanted to study photography as a phenomenon. The dichotomy between photographs as an art form and as a documentary tool generated a, comp a compelling conflict, and I wanted to move toward the heat of it. I also felt that I had to make a choice between music and photography, Boston and elsewhere. I fantasized about going to, the graduate, to graduate school at the San Francisco Art Institute and work double shifts at the bar to save money. After work, I spent most nights in the dark room building a cohesive portfolio. My clothes stank of chemicals at the end of each print printing session. Dozens of wet photographs hung on clotheslines across my apartment as the sun was coming up. I applied not once, not twice, but three times before I was admitted. In early 1983, I received the good news that I was finally accepted to the MFA program starting in the fall. In August, my mom hosted a going away barbecue in her backyard. I invited everyone I ever knew. <laughs> Old girlfriends and former high school revolutionaries shared Budweiser and Sangria with my brothers and cousins. Young people with bleached hair and unexpected body piercings came up my mom's driveway, prancing through a gauntlet of aghast aunts and uncles. My mom loved the eclectic gathering, and so did Sister Frances, my great aunt, who was a Catholic nun. Sister Frances was old school and still wore a, f a fairly elaborate black and white habit. But she was the most joyful, loving, and tolerant of all my relatives. Being a retired educator, she loved books as much as I did, and I would be forever grateful for the astronomy and space travel books that she gave me throughout my childhood. I regret that I never made a photograph of her. Toward the end of the day, my Aunt Roberta cornered me as I came out of the bathroom. She married and left Boston at 17 to run a mink farm in southern New Hampshire. During summer breaks from school, I was often shipped off to work there. 
My job was to fill the water trays, which required pulling enormous lengths of hose down the paths between the rows of hundreds of cages. The swarms of black flies and mosquitoes combined with the stench of rotting food and mink shit made those afternoons hellish. Minks are skittish and, anim are skittish and animated animals, and what haunted me most was the clickety-clack of their claws as they madly scampered in circles in their, around their small wire cages. The incessant metallic noise canceled out the birds and the frogs and the crickets and otherly, other pleasingly country sounds. Roberta, who raised six children and then drove a school bus after the mink farm failed, was suspicious of all things upper class. That included higher education, which she considered impractical. What are you going to graduate school for? She asked, pronouncing graduate school with no small amount of disdain. I sheepishly mumbled something about studying photography. She looked at me unblinkingly and asked a question I was unable to answer then, and I'm still at a loss to come up with an acceptable answer. Don't you know how to work that goddamn camera yet? <laughs> Despite Roberta's piercing question, two weeks later, Allison and I were on the road to San Francisco, making lovely photographs of fields of sunflowers bobbing their heavy heads under the Nebraskan sky. Larry Salton was one of my teachers when I entered the graduate program at the Art Institute. It's difficult to separate my first impressions of him from the sensory shift I was experiencing living in a new environment. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to see you all here. My name is Stephen Fraley. I'm the editor of uh, Dear Dave magazine, and it's also my great pleasure to be the chair of the uh, photo program here at SVA. Um, let me make a few uh, introductions first. Um, uh, Laura Larson. Is where every <laughs> there's more. <laughs> that was good. Laura Larson is represented by Leonard Linen Weinberg Gallery in New York, and she has published projects in Cabinet, Open City, The Literary Review, and Documents. Her work is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York, the Deutsche Bank, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And her work has also been reviewed in Art Forum, The New York Times, and The New Yorker. Lyle Rexer <laughs> is, is the author of several books about photography, including Photography's Antiquarian Avant-Garde and The Edge of Vision, The Rise of Abstraction in Photography, which was published by Aperture Magazine in 2009. In addition to book projects, he has published many catalog essays and contributes to the New York Times, Art in America, Modern Painters, Aperture, Dear Dave, Metropolis, and Parquet, and he's a regular columnist for Photograph Magazine. Lyle was educated at Columbia University and attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He teaches at the School of Visual Arts. Mark Alice Durant. <laughs> Mark's essays have appeared in numerous journals such as Art in America, Aperture, Dear Dave, and After Image and in catalogs and monographs regarding the work of Vic Muniz, Jimmy Durham, Marco Breuer, Richard Leerod, Robert Heineken, and McDermott and McGuff. He, is a, he has a distinguished teaching career and is a professor in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Maryland and visiting faculty at the ICP. In 2001, uh, 2011, rather, he founded the website stlucy.com. So, we're gathered here uh, this evening on a very cold New York uh, night, anticipating the snow tomorrow, uh, to celebrate the publication of Mark's 27 Contexts, an anecdotal history of photography and Laura's hidden mother, uh, and the thrilling launch of St. Lucie Books. There will, be, there will be a signing in the lobby directly afterwards, and I hope you all will stay. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you so much for being here. Um, I do want to thank SVA Photo, um, Jared Dave, Maria Dubon, um, especially Stephen Fraley, um, who's you know been a supporter and friend for a long time. Um, just you know, Dear Dave is a fantastic publication. I mean, it's I love its broad embrace of photography and all its forms. And I have to say that I think without um, the, some of the opportunities I've had in uh, writing things for uh, Dear Dave, I'm not sure 27 Contacts would have happened. Um, 
I wrote an essay called Trickle Down Counterculture for Dear Dave a number of years ago, and, um, and I proposed it to Steve, and he said, sure. And it was very eccentric, you know, um, essay about um, being a teenager and discovering photography, and um, I think that was the beginning, because um, when I wrote that, um, another friend of mine read it and said, you've been waiting all your life, you've been working on that piece all your life, or something like that, and I suddenly thought that maybe there's a book there, so... Um, Thank you again for the opportunities. Um, so I'm going to read um, a couple of uh, just uh, so 27 Contexts is um, kind of an odd um, kind of uh, book in that it's sort of Wee's memoir, photographic history, um, some theory, and my own images and other people's images. So it was difficult to place with other publishers, shall we say, and which sort of was one of the reasons why St. Lucie Books is, exists now. But um, I just wanted to say it sort of traces my sort of interest and in my involvement in photography um, in, uh, in these various chapters, like this chapter is about my father's photographs from um, Korea, which I was obsessed with as a child. Um, this is a story about my experiences in Central America and uh, in the great uh, friendship and um, hospitality that I um, received from Paola Ferrario, who is in the audience today. And so she's in this, uh, in this story. Um, and I live in Baltimore, um, which is a great place and conflicted place, but really amazing place. And uh, I'm interested in like the the idea of Baltimore and the public popular imagination. So, John Waters versus the Wire. So I'm going to read for you um, a, an excerpt from this essay, "Falling in Love with Kadelka," and then uh, read uh, this a full essay uh, called uh, "An Image for Larry Sultan." And I chose these two because uh, one is uh, they're both about being young <laughs> and about studying photography, and I thought it was an appropriate uh, sort of topic for SBA. So again, I'm just going to read a sort of excerpt from this essay. Well, let me start with this image here. Sorry. Several nights a week, I worked in a bar in Harvard Square around the corner from Cafe Algiers, a Middle Eastern restaurant run by a hostile, diminutive Palestinian who gave me the evil eye every time I stopped in for hummus and mint tea. I endured his silent intimidation because every woman who worked there was charming and beautiful. I had a crush on them all, and one in particular, Allison, who always rushed past my table without a glance. After several weeks of smiling in her general direction in a way that I hoped was not too creepy, 